Hi, Sally Webflowers. So when it comes to developing a maintainable Webflow website, consistency is the key. Just remember the last site you've reviewed and you felt like, whoa, what's going on here? If I'm going to touch this, something else will probably break. Most of the time, the problem with pages like this is a lack of consistency. And besides the use of a style guide, global classes and a clean page structure, the structure of your sections is crucial. I've seen many section structures that are thoughtless and therefore not flexible enough. For example, many use the sections to set the max width or the paddings directly on it. The problem with this is that it is hard to orientate in Webflow's navigator and things like different background colors can only be applied by combo classes and combo classes should be avoided if possible. So during the last couple of projects, I have experimented with different section structures and here's the one that I'm going to use from now on. And if you watch the video until the end, I will give you a nice little hack to boost your productivity while working with this structure. So the first thing I'm using is of course the section itself. You can use a simple diff for it, but I'm using the section element because it has a different icon in the navigator and the different icons allow a better orientation in the designer. I also go to the element settings here and define the section to actually be a section tag. By doing this, Webflow is actually using a section tag for it in the HTML of your page. I use the section only to give it a descriptive name and to set the height and width in case I need a section to be 100% of the viewport height. Let's have a look how cleaned up your project looks when everything is named proper. And that's actually the benefit of this, a better overview. Next comes the section wrap. This one I use to apply things that deviate from the site's default like text colors, background colors or position settings. For example, I give it the position relative when there is an element that should be positioned absolute to this section. Most of the things I apply to the section wrap you could actually also apply to the section itself. But by doing this you could run into trouble if you reuse your section and want to make some changes to other instances. So just to be prepared I do it this way. And next comes the container. I only use the container to set the global width and max width for the content of the page. Because it is a global class, I can make changes to it super fast. For example, when I want to increase the max width of the entire page. Next comes the page padding. I apply the paddings here because I use systems for font scaling. When the paddings are instead applied to the container itself, they keep growing according to the viewport size once the container max width kicked in. And this can lead to unwanted line breaks. I use classes like page padding large, page padding medium or page padding small to handle different content sizes. Next is the section inner. This one I use to set display settings like flexbox or grid and make use of the gaps for columns and rows. I also like to apply font alignments here in case the text of an entire section is centered for example. And here's my tip to boost your productivity while working with this section structure. I prepare one default section that contains all possible page paddings and save this as a component. So each time I need a new section, I use the component, unbind it and rename the classes. As I said at the beginning, I experimented during the last project with different section structures, but this is pretty much the best I could figure out. But maybe you have a different approach. Please share yours in the comments below. And now that you know which section structure is the right for you, you should also take a look at which page structure I use. You can find the video here. Thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel and as always, stay in the flow.